2015, 2016, there started to be a trend that the cars were a bit too easy to drive, not very challenging, not very spectacular. So there starts to be a few complaints from the public watching the race that it didn't look dramatic enough anymore, especially having lost the screaming sound of the old V8. For 2017, there was then a clear mandate from the regulations and from Formula One to present cars which would be a lot faster by several seconds a lap, uh, which would be far more spectacular to watch, uh, more challenging physically from the driver's perspective, such that it would be a bit more exciting to watch. 2017, chassis-wise, was a very large step up in performance. The cars got bigger, the tires got bigger as well. It's like from a 2017 car, everything got bigger, just to increase the potential for performance. The front wing came wider, the floor came wider with a bigger diffuser, the rear wing got wider as well, and crucially, there was the reintroduction of the barge boards. All these got put together for 2017. Aerodynamically, in terms of aerodynamic concept, what you try and do with the airflow to extract performance, 2016 to 2017 did not change so much. You were still trying to get as much front outwash as possible. It just looked like for 2017, to achieve the desired aerodynamic effect, you're being given a toolbox with a much bigger hammer. This meant the development for 2017 was very intense. The more you tried to find downforce, the more you would get. It's, it was as if for these new cars, you had less time to develop than potential available. There were other aspects of the regulations which would allow you to be highly creative. There were a few doors opening to do things a bit differently. And this is where we started finding possible new designs of the side pod, which was quite specific to the Ferrari early on. And we started to set a trend which everyone adopted because yes, aerodynamically, these sort of regulations allowed to do that. And it was just another way to get more and more performance. Alongside all these aerodynamic changes, of course, the fact the car got bigger, the car got as well heavier. Something to a minimum weight of 728 kilo. Comparatively to 2014, this weight increase was fairly benign because in parallel, the aerodynamic performance and the downforce we would achieve was far greater than the effect of the weight. Then of course, with the increased downforce, these cars were producing more drag, so they would be quite a bit slower in straight line, but the lap time you would make through corner was very, very good, shall I say. Corners which were grip limited or labeled high speed corners, but true corners in 2016, they were not corners anymore. With these new cars, you would go flat in pretty much everything you thought were corners before in terms of high speed. This is broadly speaking what the new cars brought. Much higher performance in cornering, although through high speed, it wasn't so challenging from the driver's perspective. Watching from the outside, that was the place where these cars would look truly impressive. With such an increase in performance and such an, an increase in downforce, it was more difficult to overtake because as a consequence of the grip, the braking distance became much, much shorter you would basically have only one racing line. So through 2017, all of the cars were much faster. You would start seeing, well, it's a bit difficult to overtake, a bit difficult to follow. For 2018, it was a very moderate change of regulations, trying to contain a bit the downforce increase. There was a reduction of the fin on the engine core of the car. The, uh, what we call the body wing got removed, which in itself was pure drop of downforce. Then the halo for safety got added. The halo itself was affecting the performance of the rear wing. So all these together 
meant that by regulation for 2018, teams were going to lose a little bit of base performance, but all this was not enough to counter the potential for development of these new generation of cars. 2018 was very much a continuity of 2017. The one thing which started to come very evident in 2018 with the amount of performance of these cars, tires starts, started to be stressed quite a lot, especially over a race tint. And from there, there started to be even more focus on all the tire management. We also saw some iterations from Pirelli to try and change the tires, make them firmly more resilient because in races you would see some cars blistering the tar front or rear depending on the characteristics. But you could see that the performance these cars were generating was far greater than probably what was expected before 2017. By the end of 2018, looking at 2019, there was then a genuine attempt to try and contain the downforce these cars produce while trying to find a way aerodynamically to make them a little less sensitive when you follow another car to try and promote better overtaking and better racing. And that led to the new 2019 uh, bodywork regulations. Morning, how are you? It's wonderful to be here in Schaffhausen with you. I'm very well. Uh, welcome to our session about Top Gun watches, Justin. I'm hugely excited. It's one of my favorite collections from IWC. We've actually got a trio here in front of us today. But I wanted to start first with this idea of a black pilot's watch and the connection to IWC owning that aesthetic. Just give us an idea of what was going on on IWC in the 80s in the development of that watch. Yes, you're absolutely right. I mean, the idea of this all-black watch in ceramics started back in the 90s uh, when we introduced the 3705. We just celebrated this with a, with a tribute piece. But I think this watch was created uh, actually based on two initiatives from the 80s. A is the introduction of ceramic cases, also in the color black on the Da Vinci line. And the second was actually the collaboration with Ferdinand Alexander Porsche in this famous range of, of titanium watches. And there we had also kind of full black coated pieces as part of that. So he basically brought the idea of the all black watch to RWC. And then we move a decade or two further forwards. And in 2007, we see the partnership with Top Gun. No, you're absolutely right. I mean, we, we have the heritage as a brand that we make professional watches, also for professional pilots. That's part of the story of the famous Spitfire Mark 11 and so on. And in the context of Top Gun, we, we picked that up again and, and, and re-established a closer relationship with the Top Gun School, the Strike Fighter Tactics Instructor Program, as it is called today. And um, so we work with these pilots, which is really the elite of fast jet pilots, and to work with them, to wear our watches. There's, there's watches that are officially uh, and exclusive to graduates from the Top Gun School. 
Um, we are very proud of that. And from there, we, we grew into that network of uh, fast jet pilots and worked together with more than 20 squadrons all around the world uh, and supply them with watches. One of the key design codes from the Top Gun collection is this little touch of red that you end up uh, introducing on the, the dial or the hands. I personally love that, uh, the tip on the seconds hand there. Just give us an idea of how important that is in the, the design process for Top Gun references. The touch of red brings this extra detail that is A, improving the readability, but also on the other hand, brings a, a richer detail and a more refined balance to the dials. So we have the running seconds, we have the stop hands on the chronographs, but also the automatic pieces have the, the red details, like, for example, the, the, the Top Gun written on the dial above the automatic. This is actually the new uh, big pilot, uh, 43 millimeter in ceramic. This is what we now introduce with Watches and Wonders. How important is it uh, to have those connections still alive and, and well to this day? Now for us, it's, it's fantastic to see how, how well we are received as a brand also by, by, by the pilots in the US. I mean, they see and they appreciate the history of IWC being founded by an American. Uh, engineer, uh, Florentine Arrasto Jones. Uh, but for us, it's even more important to work with a lead of, of fast jet pilots to support actually the, our positioning that we are not just making very beautiful and very luxurious watches, but we are really making watches to the highest professional standards. Christian, as always, thank you very much. Always really uh, interesting, insightful. And I know that I'm biased because I have one black watch and it's, it's a pilot's watch, but... Um, Thank you for your time as always. Really enjoyed it. Thank you very much, Justin. Hello, I'm Emma Raducanu and I'm here today with Porsche. The dreams that kept me going back then were to win Grand Slams and to play at Wimbledon. For me, it's all about continuous improvement and getting better and just trying to learn and experience new things. I feel like my culture and my family background has definitely played a part in, in who I am and my personality and character. Yeah, when I was younger, I remember that the Porsche Grand Prix in Stuttgart was always a big tournament and a very different and unique tournament because the winner would get a Porsche and uh, that was very special. I love motorsports because I feel like it's just a drive for continuous improvement and I feel like it's actually quite similar to tennis. Let's go! My favorite Porsche car is the 911 for sure, because I feel like throughout every generation it is so unique and so beautiful in its own distinct way. And uh, I feel like it's one of the most iconic cars that are out there. One of my more recent coaches has a 911 vintage Targa. And uh, you know, it, it's, I just love the differences between the new, the modern day ones and the vintage classics. And whenever I would see him every morning, I would be like, you know, dreaming of one day sitting in my own. Yeah, cool coach. <laughs> Let's go. Porsche has always been in my head. It's, it's one of the brands that I've always loved from a young age. For me to be a brand ambassador for Porsche, it means a lot because I feel like now I might be able to sit in my own 911 one day and that was a dream that I had as a kid. But also it's really important for me to, to align with partners and brands that I, I really feel passionate about and I identify with. And I feel like because motorsports has always been a part of me, I think this, this partnership with Porsche is incredible. And honestly, I'm really excited to see what sort of exciting things we can do going forward. We need to open doors for each other because umdung umdung abandu. I just wanted to be someone that creates stuff, someone that adds value to people's lives and moves the community forward. I was born and raised in Langa, Cape Town. Langa is a fantastic place. It's one of the first townships uh, in Cape Town, I think South Africa as well. 
it came to me that, you know, it would be cool to have a delivery service for people in the community whereby someone would just call you and you would go to that particular house and, you know, they'd give you a list of groceries and money to just go do the groceries for them. At the moment we have 20 bicycles, meaning we have also 20 boys. It started in February 2020 and since then the business has grown, especially during the lockdown. These are times that are a struggle for many families. There's no income for people. But for our business, I think it has affected it in a positive way. These boys are able to come to work and make money for themselves, take the income to their homes and help where they're able to help. Opening doors for me means giving other people an opportunity to create something for themselves and for their life. As young people, we need to have streams of income. We need to start opening our businesses. What we're doing now, you know, we're opening doors for young people to be able to generate an income throughout the lockdown. I think it's very important to support local businesses because these are the businesses that add value to communities, you know, providing a platform and an opportunity for people to do something with their lives. The Great Lion Trail is an art installation taking place across the globe. Its objective is to raise vital funds for Tusk's work, supporting conservation and local communities across Africa. It follows on from the highly successful Rhino Trail in 2018, with this year focusing on the plight of the lion, the king of beasts. The African lion population has halved over the past 25 years, and now numbers are less than 23,000. For the Land Rover Lion, our brief from our Chief Creative Officer, Professor Jerry McGovern, was simple. Keep a clean and reductive approach, producing a simple but strong design which builds on the themes and colors of his previous rhino sculpture. Jerry directed us to symbolize bravery and to have a creative execution inspired by the vivid sunsets that occur in the lion's natural habitat. This is reflected in the lion's striking gradation of color. Starting from rich red and orange hues, Fading to a chrome finish, Jerry's vision was to visually represent the threat of extinction faced by the lion. The effect is produced by layering the paint, which creates a real depth and richness to the color. The highly reflective chrome not only reflects the environment in which the lion is placed, but also acts as a metaphorical mirror, encouraging people to see how their individual actions can make a difference, no matter how small. This was a very important part of Jerry's brief. The plinth is finished with a marble-based terrazzo top made from reclaimed and recycled materials. This stunning surface is strong and unique, just like these iconic predators. Land Rover supports Tusk's desire to achieve sustainable conservation and has worked with the organization for over 10 years, providing vehicles and funding to enable Tusk reach remote territories and carry out their vital work in the field, including lion conservation projects in Kenya. I wanted to explore the world from a really young age. I never considered a career in aviation because I did grow up seeing any female pilots. It wasn't until I saw my sister in her uniform and seeing her actually fly that I realized that it was a possibility. Hello, my name is Nayan Tarabi. I'm from Bahrain. I'm 21 years old and I'm a cadet training to be a pilot. I was really young when my sister went to start training as a cadet, so I wasn't entirely sure what it meant. I actually did get the chance to fly with her. She flew me to London. It was probably one of the best experiences of my life. When I decided finally that I actually wanted to be a pilot was I told my parents and they were really happy with my decision. 
from a very young age, my parents were always pushing us to achieve the best that we could and telling us that nothing was impossible. I remember putting on the uniform for the first time. I felt so proud and so happy. I felt like a real pilot. The cadets in my class were really welcoming and I'm so glad I met them. We really helped each other through thick and thin. I've definitely made some lifelong friends here. Our instructors told us that they're not training us to be pilots, they're training us to be captains. And I think that's such an important thing to take away. The fact that being a captain comes with responsibility. Hands down, the most unique thing about EFTA is the fact that not only do we train on a single engine piston, but we train on a jet aircraft. And that's something you won't find any other academy. I like the Phenom more than the Cirrus. I think only because the Phenom is much bigger and um, you get to feel like you're flying a jet. The views we see when we're flying in the UAE is actually really beautiful. Whenever I'm on the ground, I'm always thinking of flying and it doesn't help that our runway is right outside. Being the first international graduate from EFTA makes me really proud. It's been a long journey and I'm really happy that I'm almost there at the end. Women make up half the population, but we only make up 5% of the aviation industry. And I really hope to see that number rise in the future. And I hope that just by being here, maybe I can help motivate any young girls out there. And I really want to tell them that they should go for it, that it is a possibility. I started out making model paper planes in school in the physics club around five years ago, and now I'm flying a jet. So if there's anything I hope people take away from my story is the fact that they should follow their dreams and if they're passionate about something, never give up. The evolution of mankind has been around water the elixir that separates this planet from others. All of these water bodies have a story to tell, which is that of survival. My childhood memory is of a pond next to my house and the beautiful rainfall of Chennai. But the lake and the pond, which was so close to my heart, transforming into an urban dump was something which I couldn't take. I wanted to initiate something towards reviving, protecting these lakes and ponds. One of us cannot do everything, but all of us can do something. So I started the Environmentalist Foundation of India. We started volunteering at this lake here in Chennai where we'd had uh, public participation, voluntary activities towards cleaning that lake. The Rolex Awards for Enterprise was a major turning point in the year 2012 when I was 25. The Rolex Awards are not about recognizing what you've done. It's a booster to what you want to do more. It gave us the confidence that we can dream big and ensured that we've been able to move from one lake to 164. The science behind restoration here is to ensure that the lake needs minimal human intervention, that the lake can take care of its own self and to ensure that there is water available, not just for human beings, but there's protected habitats for all life forms. Extremely dirty. Now, we've brought it to this level. When I go back to a lake we've restored today, it's a pristine habitat with a lot more bird life, reptile life, and the trees have fully grown. That by itself gives me a clear indication of ecology bouncing back in that water body. We have these very clear metrics of water quality, groundwater levels, of ecology, and the psychological well-being in terms of community participation, which tells us if a project has done its job or not. Protecting these water bodies is critically important to prevent any climate catastrophe in the form of a flood or a drought. That's the biggest challenge now. So there is more to do. I think 2021, we've engaged eight to 10,000 people working for the planet. 
that's what excites me i really hope we leave behind a model that can set a standard for real time result oriented conservation that's what water has taught us it takes a path it finds its way and it reaches its destination April 12, 1945. President Franklin Roosevelt dies of a cerebral hemorrhage in Warm Springs, Georgia at age 63. Let me assert my firm belief that the only thing we have to fear is fear itself. Roosevelt, who led America through the Great Depression and most of World War II, served a record 12 years in office. Vice President Harry Truman succeeds Roosevelt in the White House. 1861. Start of the American Civil War. Confederate forces fire on the Union garrison at Fort Sumter in Charleston, South Carolina. Fighting between the North and South lasts four years with more than half a million deaths. 1961. Soviet cosmonaut Yuri Gagarin becomes the first man to fly in space, orbiting the Earth once before making a safe landing. 1981. America's first space shuttle, named Columbia, blasts off from Cape Canaveral, Florida, on its maiden flight. More than two decades later, Columbia meets a tragic end. It disintegrates on re-entry, killing its seven-passenger crew. And 1947. My name is Dave Letterman. I'm the host of The Late Show, America's most successful sea student. David Letterman, the late-night TV talk show host, is born in Indianapolis. Today in History, April 12th, Mike Gracia, The Associated Press. Welcome back in our studio and in today's news, 